Hi class and welcome to this week's um, online learning module. This is the lecture that you should be listening to before you complete all the activities and do the discussion posts. Today we're going to talk about um, information processing and how the brain processes information in chunks. Uh, we're also going to touch on brain research and brain science that um, uh, is a, has become over the past decade a larger, um, a larger part of the field of education. You'll recall previously last week, in the last weeks, we've been talking about both behavioral theories of learning, Pavlov, who did classical conditioning, Skinner, who did operant conditioning, and uh, last week we talked about Albert Bandura, who came up with the social theory of learning. Tonight we're going to switch gears and talk about information processing models, brain search. We're going to talk a little bit about why we remember or forget things, helpful memory strategies, and um, uh, some different uh, cognitive teaching strategies. First of all, let's talk about what is an information processing model. And by information processing model, we mean the way that the brain deals with information. And if you're looking around, uh, whether you're reading or whether you're observing or whether you're just thinking sometimes, you're constantly dealing with information that's entering your mind through your senses. You might be hearing things, that's information. You might be tasting something and the brain gathers information. You might be seeing things. All of that is information. And the vast majority of information that enters our brains is immediately discarded um, and because it's really of no use to us. Some of that information, though, is held in our memories for a short time and then forgotten, and some is retained much longer, perhaps for as long as the rest of our lives. So you might uh, not be able to remember, for example, what you had for dinner three nights ago, but you might remember your first ever birthday gift. If we study this diagram, we can see um, a, a visual diagram of the way the brain operates and processes information. Um, so if you start on the left side, um, information processing model basically means that memories act in the same way to or similar way to a computer as shown as this model on the screen. So if you think about the brain like a, a computer, a, a computer handles information by, the, by putting information into working memory and then coding it into longer term uh, storage. And similarly, when we, let's say we see something that could be considered a stimulus, that's going to go into an area called sensory memory. Um, and that sensory memory can handle about three to seven different units of memory. Uh, so a, a unit might count, for example, as uh, so, uh, uh, I'm looking at the window now and I'm seeing a butterfly flying by. So that might be one unit of memory. The sensory memory stays there for about half to three seconds. And then the vast majority of that, unless I focused on it, is forgotten. So your, your um, brain is receiving all kinds of stimuli right now that you're probably not even noticing. It might be something in your peripheral vision that just stays there for a brief, a brief time and then is forgotten. Uh, but so the vast majority of that sensory memory just is forgotten. It's not encoded in the brain. However, because I focused on the butterfly, I paid attention to the butterfly, that went into something called the working memory. Now the working memory is a little bit longer term. It can stay there about five to 15 seconds unless I rehearse it and talk about it and focus on it. And if I don't pay any attention to it, it's likely to be forgotten. However, and it, oh, and the working memory can hold about seven to nine chunks of that, those types of information. However, if I focus on it, let's say I am learning my multiplication facts and I'm studying them, I'm focusing on them, they're more likely to be retained. After a while focusing on it, that 
uh, working memory can be encoded into long-term memory. So if I work on my multiplication facts enough, uh, for example, if I'm having trouble remembering 7 times 9 is 63, but I focus on it, I can encode it into long-term memory so that it can be uh, retrieved again uh, whenever I need it and put back into working memory. And so rehearsal helps with that. If I don't do that, it's going to be forgotten. If I go to long-term memory, that's an infinite capacity that once something has uh, not been filtered out through all those steps and I retain it, it's there for a long, long time, probably permanently until perhaps old age or uh, some of those longer-term memories start to wear away or erode. Um, so this is sort of how the brain functions with memory processing. So therefore, the three major components of memory are the sensory register, that very short-term area, the short-term or working memory that sort of holds things until the brain decides whether it needs them or not, and then if encoded, the long-term memory. At each stage, the learning process is controlled by the learner. This control may be conscious or unconscious. And the executive process determines what now winds up in long-term memory. So we really have to focus on it to get something to wind up in long-term memory. The sensory register receives large amounts of information from each of the senses and holds it for a very short time, no more than a couple of seconds. If nothing happens, it results in very short-term memory linked to the senses. If we don't uh, attend to it, it'll be quickly forgotten. Attending to information, by the way, can also be called perception. Short-term memory is storage that holds five to nine bits of information. Information enters working memory from both the sensory register and the long-term memory, rehearsals the process of repeating information in order to hold it in working memory. And finally, long-term memory is the part of the memory system which a large amount of information and skills are stored for an indefinite time period. Theorists divide long-term memory into three parts, episodic memory, semantic memory, and procedural memory, and a fourth one that I'll talk about. So episodic memory is like when you remember something. I remember, for example, uh, looking out of the window at my brother when I was very young, watching him ride a bike outside. And I see that, um, I see that memory as if it were a movie, a series of episodes. Semantic memory is how we study and organize information, and we put them into what's called schema or schemata. And this means simply we organize them. So, for example, I have organized in my brains, and so have you, uh, those things known as fat, fat, math facts. I have organized state capitals. I have organized list of things and sublists within things. And I have a lot of schema uh, to organize information, and so do you. Procedural memory means knowing how to do something. So when you learn, for example, how to um, count to 10, that's a procedural memory. Flashbulb memory is a special kind of memory, and that's if you have a very vivid memory of something that happened to you that was important. Uh, so it might be, for example, uh, if you had a car accident, and that's just sort of like a, a picture with a flashbulb that's frozen in your mind. You, you sort of see it in still life. We know all about this from the brain. Where does this information come from? Well, there's a special kind of technology called, you might have heard of magnetic res resonance imaging and, or, or uh, MRIs. And some of you might have even had an MRI. And MRI is, is a static sort of x-ray of the brain showing the blood vessels and pathways and things or soft to other soft tissue. But a functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI, enables scientists to observe the brain in action. And so what that means is they can take pictures or movies of things happening inside your brain and have pathways light up 
Um, and so they've learned a lot through this science about where things in the brain occur and what happens. Um, so for example, if, uh, if you take a participant and you put them in an fMRI machine, uh, which is, um, which doesn't hurt, by the way, the, the way a CAT scan doesn't hurt or MRI doesn't hurt, and you show them pictures of things that are shocking or scary, they can actually see what pathways light up in the brain, and scientists can understand about what parts of the brain um, deal with anger or deal with hostility or deal with violence or deal with love or deal with all these different emotions. And so they understand much more about what's going on inside the brain. Specific parts of the brain, we know specific uh, process, specific types of information in conjunction with other brain sites. So uh, that old myth, for example, that you only use 10% of your brain, that's a myth. Uh, and some of the things that we're gonna, you're gonna be learning, or maybe you've already learned if you've done the myths site, or you uh, are about to do the quiz. There's a lot of misconceptions out there about, about the brain and education. Um, what we do know is that scientists actually know very little about the brain and education. We know a lot about the brain and how it functions in terms of, uh, for example, what site lights up when, um, when, a, when a, a participant is exposed to violent images but we don't know how to apply things to education. So some of the things that, you're, that you might have heard in a professional development workshop or just read online might not be true when it comes to brain science. So I want you to learn to approach all of the things that you hear about brain science in education with a grain of salt. What we do know is that as individuals gain experience at something, as they they try to attend to it and they practice it, the brain function becomes more efficient. So what does that mean? It means, for example, if I'm a third grader and I'm learning my math facts, if I could have an fMRI of my brain at that time, it would show the neural pathways becoming sleeker and more efficient as you process that information, as you attend to it. Some solid implications of brain research for education that we know are not hokum. Uh, one is that studies find that the amount of stimulation early in a child's development that should read correlates with the number of neural connections or synapses, which are the basis for higher learning and memory. So what that means is early childhood and, and infancy needs a lot of stimulation, enrich, enriching activities, parents talking to their children, taking them out for to see things, a lot of stimulation uh, for early learning to occur. And that's the best time for it to occur. And indeed, there have actually been sad cases of children raised in orphanages with little or no stimulation, where they basically just lie in a crib all day and look at white walls. And some of those children had learning difficulties later on. Another important finding of brain research is the discovery that as a person gains knowledge and skill, his or her brain becomes more efficient, which is what we were referring to before. Some applications of brain research, not all learning is equally likely. Some is more, or some, some types of learning are easier than others, and some at different ages. For example, language and spatial relationships come more easily to young learners than advanced math concepts. And we know that language to young learners is much easier to pick up than language to older learners, and this is because of brain development. The brain is actually in the, in the best place to learn languages early in childhood. Other countries, like countries in Europe take advantage of this and start foreign language training much earlier than in the United States, as early as preschool or before. The second application is that brain development constrains cognitive outcome. So what that means is, if you think about all the cognitive theorists like Piaget, you cannot 
cause something to happen before the brain is ready for it. So if I'm trying to apply that to math facts, for example, I can't teach math facts to most two-year-olds because the brain physically is just not ready to handle that information. The third is that some regions of the brain may be particularly important for cognitive outcomes and supporting certain sorts of neural activities related to learning and cognition. And so what, what we mean by that is specific is, is particularly there's an area of the brain in the front called the prefrontal cortex. And we know that this area is more uh, involved with learning than other areas of the brain, such as at the back of the brain, uh, which mostly controls the limbic system, breathing and and also some of the more primal um, emotions, like anger. So what does this all mean for you? I mean, there's a lot of brain science here, but what can you do in the classroom? Well, the first thing is that you can make learning developmentally appropriate. So don't ask students, sort of like when we think back to when we talked about Piaget and, and uh, concrete versus abstract thinking. Don't make students do something for which they're developmentally not ready to do. So perhaps their brains just aren't developed enough and they cannot, um, they cannot handle information that's abstract. We also know that um, because the brain isn't fully formed until about the age of 25, uh, teenagers particularly make poor decisions. That, that area of the brain involved with risk-taking and judgment they may, that isn't fully developed, so they make poor decisions. And so you have to take that into account when you're, when you're thinking about um, what they're doing in the classroom. The second application is to make meaning, learning meaningful to the student. And we know from a lot of research that this is more likely to cause them to pay attention to it which in, more, in turn is more likely they'll transfer it into long-term memory. So what does that mean to make learning meaningful? It, it means to connect it to their lives in somehow. So for example, if you're talking about a subject like um, you're teaching science and the, and the science of why airplanes stay afloat, they're going to begin the discussion perhaps with saying, who's taken an airplane trip? And did you ever look out the window? And what did you see? And any way you can think to connect it to their lives and make it more meaningful. Sometimes you can make learning meaningful by making projects authentic. And so what that means is giving them some choice, giving them a voice in what they do, and making it something that they feel connected to. A third application is teach students how to become aware of and monitor their own thinking process. So you might have heard me call this metacognition, thinking about your thinking. Whenever we reflect in class with a post-assessment, for example, that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to monitor your learning process with a series of prompts, such as, what did you learn? Enhance your thinking enhance your answer, use vocabulary words, diagram it. You want to try to get students to organize those schema that we talked about or those schemata with diagrams, fill in the blanks with um, anything that you can do to make them focus on their own learning. Another area of research, sub-research in this particular, in number three, is goal setting. So at the beginning, you can ask students to set goals for what they want to attain. Let's say that you are um, teaching a unit on, uh, I've done math and science, let's go to reading. Let's say you're teaching a unit on reading. And in your reading, you want to students to be able to um, identify main characters in the story and identify character motivation. Well, you're going to post that as your learning objective or target in the room, and you're going to have students set goals uh, about their progress towards that. You know, identify one main character, identify the goals. Maybe you even have them write it down in a reading reflection journal 
and then start their progress towards that. One of the things we notice when we ask students to set their own goals and chart their progress and monitor their progress, learning goes way up. What makes information meaningful? Let's get back to that and talk for a minute about that. Information that makes sense and has significance to students is more meaningful than inert knowledge and information learned by rote. So rote is things like memorization of facts or associations, multiplication tables, chemical symbols. If you think back of learning those things, you're probably uh, not going to have some wonderful, oh, I really loved learning the chemical elements table. Meaningful learning, in contrast, it's not arbitrary and it relates the information or concepts to their lives, like we talked about. You can use cognitive teaching strategies to make learning relevant and to activate prior knowledge. So in the airplane example I gave you, uh, we both um, made learning relevant because we talked about application to them and we activated a prior knowledge from, okay, what did you observe out the window? As I said, metacognition helps students learn about thinking and controlling and using their own thinking process, uh, knowledge about one's own learning and how to learn, and thinking skills or study skills are examples of metacognitive skills, as well as goal setting and some of the others we talked about. One of the skills that, that students need is study strategies. However, research on study strategies is confusing at best. There are some study strategies that seem to make a difference and others that don't. Um, few forms of studying are found to be always effective and fewer still are ne never effective. So you, the vast majority are sometimes they're effective and sometimes they're not. But most effective methods involve learners in reshaping the information. So when I give you um, an assessment, <clears throat> excuse me, in class that says take the information, take a word list and diagram it into a concept map, that's an example of reshaping the information. These are the ones that require students to form those schemata that help them remember things. Rereading or highlighting without consciously choosing the most important information to highlight is not effective. So you might have asked students to highlight during uh, your career, and you might have noticed that students will just take a marker many times and highlight everything. They'll highlight page after page after page indiscriminately. When what you meant is think about the important phrases and highlight those. So you can't just say to students highlight, you have to teach them how to highlight, how to pick out the most important few words that summarize the main idea in a paragraph or a few sentences. There are some important study strategies that take advantage of, um, of the concepts we've been talking about. You can give students practice tests before you give them the actual test. This helps them organize the information, as does note taking. Um, when you do note taking, in middle school, it's good to do it in sort of a guided fashion uh, using the computer or overhead. Um, as they get older, they can be released a little bit more independently. It might be a good idea to take, um, take up these notes from time to time and grade them or you look at them. They're selective, directed, underlining, or highlighted as I've discussed before. Summarizing means putting things in their own words. This forces them to grapple with the information in a meaningful way. Writing to learn, um, any type of writing strategy that extends the learning. Outlining, uh, something that sort of fallen out of favor, but I'm, I'm not happy with that because outlining, while students don't necessarily like to do it, really teaches them how to put things in order and how to form those mental schema. And finally, mapping like concept mapping is another great strategy for study strategies. Thanks everybody, and um, next week, please read chapter seven.
or in your Slavin book. And I hope everybody's having a great Halloween.